Okay. So I think we are just going to get started now. Um, it is 722. We have 157 people on. So um, I think that's a quorum. Give us just one second. And we will get started. All righty, so we will get started. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone. My name is Marlena Fontes. Um, as I said before, some of you may know me or recognize me, some may not. Um, I went to Shutesbury Elementary School back in the day. I guess that was over 20 years ago. <laughs> um, this was event, it was put on by our group, Smart Solar Shutesbury. And we are part of a coalition that includes Smart Solar Amherst and Smart Solar Western Mass. Um, so I think, you know, just to sort of set the tone for today, um, you know, we know that our climate and our planet is really teetering on the edge of climate chaos. Um, we know that time is of the essence and pr protecting our ecosystems, as well as stopping our dependency on fossil fuels and increasing renewable energy is essential to the continuation of life on this earth. Personally, as a mother and also a mother to be, um, nothing feels more urgent to me than to fight climate change. Um, so Smart Solar Shootsbury is holding this forum because right now there are proposals for a large scale solar, a large scale solar project, um, large scale solar projects across our state. And I believe that the, the proposed solar project in Shootsbury is one of the largest. Um, currently Coles, one of the largest landowners in Massachusetts and AMP, Canadian solar company, are proposing to build a solar project that would be um, has now grown to be around 362 acres. That is the total project area. Um, so that includes 157 acres at Montague Carver Road, 47 acres Pratt Corner Road East, 40 acres Pratt Corner Road West, 92.6 uh, acres Pratt Corner Road South, and 25 acres on Levitt Road West. As a group um, here at Smart Solar Shootsbury, um, we are really focused on making sure that industrial solar developments are not being built at the expense of our water, wetlands, and our environment. Um, we are pro-solar. We want to make sure Shootsbury develops solar using the model that is right for our town, both economically and environmentally. We hope today that our panelists can address some of the questions that we ourselves had about these types of solar projects, including, is deforestation in exchange for solar actually beneficial to our environment? How have similar projects affected the local ecosystems? How are these projects expanding in our region? And what have other towns experienced with these types of projects? Just, just a word on the format. Um, this form, forum is not an open meeting. We will be introducing our panelists and asking them to answer some specific questions, then asking them questions from participants. And some of you have already emailed your questions to me and I will um, be trying to get to as many of them as possible. Um, also, if you have a question that comes up, please type it in the chat. And as I said, we'll get to as many of them as possible, but of course we will likely not get to all of them. For anyone whose questions aren't answered or have questions that maybe are better directed or better answered um, by AMP Coles themselves, uh, we would invite you to join our next Smart Solar Shootsbury open meeting on December 20th at 7.15 p.m. Um, there, we're going to do a deep dive into the information that we do have about the proposed project, what we think about the information that we've already gotten from AMP polls, and the questions that we feel that we as a town still need answered. Just as a couple ground rules for the forum and a reminder, um, we are all coming to this forum with curiosity and respect. Um, we treat each other as neighbors, even when we disagree, and we hope everyone here today comes with the goal of listening, learning, and engaging in a respectful debate, but ultimately with the goal to uplift our community as a whole. Um, I know at least that's, that's where we are coming from. So now on to introduce the wonderful panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, William Muma, Bill Muma. He's an emeritus professor of international environmental policy 
and the co-founding uh, the founding director of the Center for in International Environment and Resource Policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He is the co-founder and co-director of the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts. He is a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and serves on boards of several organizations committing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, conserving ecosystems, and promoting sustainable energy systems. He is also a member of the Union of Concerned Scientists. We also have Meg Sheehan on the line. Um, she is a public interest environmental lawyer with over 30 years of experience. She's worked as an assistant attorney general for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as a staff attorney at the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority at the Boston Harbor Cleanup. She's a graduate of Colgate University and Boston College University. She serves on the board of several environmental organizations, including the Wildlands Trust of Southeastern Massachusetts, the Jones River Watershed Association and the Nature Conservancy Massachusetts chapter. She co-founded several campaigns, including the Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts, the Totten River Campaign and the Cape Cod Baywatch. Recognition for her work includes the Briggs Leadership Award from the Wildlands Trust and the John O'Connor Grassroots Leadership Award from Clean Water Action. We also have another panelist is Emily Cohen, she is a resident of Williamburg and her property abuts a solar project. She is also an amazing acupuncturist and practitioner of Chinese herbal medicine. In her practice, she works with clients on a wide, on a wide range of issues, taking a holistic approach to health. And we've asked her to speak today about her personal experience as an abutter to a solar project and how that affected water and runoff and the forest around her property. Uh, we will also be sharing a short video that we compiled um, of the project near her land. And last but certainly not least, we have Marianne Connor. She is the interim manager at Co-op Power. Um, a word about Co-op Power, they are a consumer-owned sustainable energy cooperative. They operate a regional network of community energy cooperatives to create a multi-class, multi-racial movement for a sustainable and just energy future. Um, their community energy co-ops uh, are many, but they include Co-op Power Boston Metro East, Co-op Power Franklin County, um, Co-op Power Hamden County, and Co-op Power of Southern Vermont, just to name a few. And Co-op Power itself is owned by over 500 members in New England. So um, without further ado, I think our first question is going to be for Bill. And I think um, this is a question that was emailed to us and it's one of the central questions um, that we posed for this forum. We, we know at, that we need to get off of fossil fuels immediately and shift to renewable energy. We often hear that in terms of carbon sequestration, solar panels are more efficient, in more efficient than forests. Um, another question I got is how, do, specifically, how do you counter um, the carbon metrics argument presented by some climate activists and town committees that solar yields more energy and saves more CO2 and GHG emissions than forest sequester. So Bill, I'll pass it off to you. And so who gets the easy questions on the panel? <laughs> uh, I mean, if it's that's a very narrow interpretation of the relative benefits of forests and solar panels. Let me just start by saying, um, I'm a climate scientist, I have, um, written about the technology, including solar, over a 20 year period with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, I have solar panels on my own home. They're on the roof where I think they belong. Um, uh, and um, uh, I'm also, as you can see, my background here is a, a photo that was taken at the, uh, around the beginning of September this year, uh, up on the Taconic Range, uh, right where Massachusetts and New York come together. And, um, you can see behind me, uh, there's a lot of forested land out here in Northwest uh, Massachusetts. Um, but you can see there's some cleared patches and those are mostly agricultural lands off in the distance. Um, it, it, is, it is a very, it, it is correct that, that if you looked uh, over, let's say the 20, 30 year life, 25 or 30 year lifetime of a solar array, uh, that it will produce a, a significant amount of zero carbon electricity. 
but if you look at the if and 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 if you but but it will not remove any carbon dioxide from the atmosphere the forest the argument sort of gets a little confused here the the forest is removing yes a smaller amount of electric uh, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than the the solar panels are producing assuming that the solar panels are replacing coal burning power plants but why assume that they're replacing coal burning power plants i mean they could be um we don't have any coal burning power plants in Massachusetts. Um, it should at least be compared to the average mix of emissions from the entire grid. Or we could just say it is, you know, the solar panels are, are, um, are, are, are complementing whatever uh, uh, we, we are using. Um, but they are not removing any things. And as I'll say later on in my presentation, they don't perform any of the many, many functions that a forest preserves, uh, pr provide. Um, uh, basically, it's a clear cut, and we know that clear cuts have zero ecological benefits. So there are many benefits of a forest that, are, that, that solar panels do not provide, and I'll talk about those in, in my presentation. Thank, thank you, Bill. Do you want to um, move into your presentation now? I can do that if you're if you're willing. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Great. That's um, that's so, me. I'm Remy. I'm the tech person. Just give me like thirty seconds to get that pulled up. Okay. Or, or here, let me. Could I do it? My could I do the presentation through sh uh, screen share? Sure. Please? Yeah. Okay. So I will click on screen share, and there it is. And I will do slideshow. That should that should be working for everyone. Is that right? Looks good to me. Okay. All right. Um, uh, for solar and climate, um, it's uh, this. This seems to be the triangle that we're we're dealing with here. Um, uh, why are we why are we even having this conversation? Uh, well, it goes back to a report that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced in um, uh, 2018, in which they they uh, uh, they were asked by governments, uh, uh, as you know, governments in in 2015 in Paris agreed that the temperature should not rise more than one and a half degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit uh, between now and 2100. Um, by 2100, over over actually, the baseline keeps shifting a little bit, but it's it's uh, supposedly uh, from pre-industrial times, but nobody knows what that is. So uh, right now they're talking about basically 1900. So to to meet that goal, um, uh, they found they they did a lot of analysis and they did some modeling and they concluded that to keep the temperatures from rising excessively global net anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions must decline by about 45% from 2005 levels by 2030, reaching net zero around 2050. This term net is the key phrase here uh, uh, because um, it, it means the difference between what we emit and what nature takes out. So we must simultaneously reduce all our greenhouse gas emissions and increase the removal of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And that is best done by forest carbon accumulation. That is, car we, we could, our forest could be absorbing and accumulating a lot more carbon. By the way, I, I prefer the term accumulate because that counts both what is in the forest and what is being added to the forest. If we only look at the removal rates, that can be misleading. So this is this is the key the key to the to the to the problem and why we're having this whole discussion. Let me just state right up front: we need solar panels and we need forests. <laughs> and uh, solar panels are this zero carbon source of electricity, but forests globally currently accumulate about 25 percent of the carbon dioxide we emit globally each year out of the atmosphere. So how can we have them both? I really like the name you've chosen, Smart Solar. That's exactly right. And I'll make some suggestions a little further along as to how we can be smart about solar. And we have to protect our forests 
and the, the, for some of our, a good part of our forest and sustainably manage the working forest. We're still gonna have a forestry industry and, and uh, many forest managers do a very good job of that, but there are also many who do not. Uh, just a couple of pictures here of uh, some of the uh, really magnificent forests we have out here in Western Massachusetts. On the right, there's, there's uh, uh, Bob Leverett, uh, well known to many of you. Uh, he's, he does a lot of direct measurements of these large trees that we have in, in Massachusetts. And, and uh, the analysis I'll be giving in a moment are based on, uh, on some of his, his data. So, we, so this is what we have with forests. They are incredibly complex ecosystems. And, um, and, you know, the tree that Bob's measuring there is probably 150 to 200 years old. And uh, if we cut it down, it'll take 150 to 200 years at best to get it back. So this is just a picture of uh, the largest PV array. It happens to be in Connecticut, and it's cut from forests. I'll show, show one from Massachusetts in a moment, but this just gives an idea of a very large scale array. And you can see it has been just carved out of the forest. Um, so um, one mistake that is often made when doing the analysis is uh, uh, they only do the analysis of the area of the panels. But as you can see, there's quite an area around uh, the panels that is cut. And then there's a road that has to be put in. And there has to be a, a, line, a, a cut for the, uh, uh, the transmission line that goes out of here. And uh, we found in some analyses that were done out here in Berkshire County that um, uh, up in the upper left picture is uh, as one goes, uh, uh, comes down from the hairpin turn on Route 2 and looks down on North Adams. You can see this area has just been carved out of the forest. Um, and you can see a road going sort of diagonally from the bottom center to upper left. Um, and and uh, that um, happens to be a, 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 a road that, that goes between uh, North Adams and Adams. And about just as after you go into Adams, there is an abandoned shopping mall that has been totally knocked down, raised, and there's nothing there but the asphalt huge parking lot. Right next to that is a solar array that is on some abandoned, degraded land. And there's a power line that runs right along there. So there was no need to build this here. That other property was available. And um, a, uh, uh, this was a project that was just done to use Google Earth to estimate the total area that's harvested. And what you can see from the lines here, and you can see the data here is, the claim is that it's 6.1 acres. That's the area of the panels. But the actual area, or excuse me, is nine, nine acres. And um, the actual area that's, that's, that's uh, uh, cleared is 27 acres. So it's always much more than is, is, is claimed. Um, the um, um, Clark University did a study that finds that half of all the forest loss is for solar. Oops, sorry. And um, we found that 17 of the 34, um, uh, uh, yeah, 17 of the 34 uh, projects that have occurred in Berkshire County all involve clearing of forests. So um, I, I am on the board and, and actually work uh, with some of the scientists at the Woodwell Climate Research Center down in Falmouth. And uh, they've used remote sensing to do some studies. And this is one of the studies that they did. And this is showing, this is just showing the uh, changes in Massachusetts forest, the carbon that's in the, in the forest and the standing trees in the forest. In, these numbers are in thousands of tons of carbon. And it shows in 2003 and 2017, and the, there was a total loss of about 1,952, uh, uh, well, 1.952 million tons of carbon a gain of 4.7 million tons of carbon for a net change of 27, uh, of 2.7 million tons of carbon. If there had been no harvesting, this loss would have been added to this gain and you would get 6,685, um, uh, 6.685 uh, uh, million tons of carbon accumulated. 
But those trees that were harvested, had they not been harvested, would have grown. And that would have added something around 550 um, uh, to, to, the, to this total, 550,000. So that would total 7.2 million tons, which is obviously greater than the 4.7 million tons that uh, actually occurred. That's a lot more. And that's only a period of 14 years. And I saw somewhere that uh, Massachusetts, there's been discussions that we would convert 150,000 acres of forest for solar panels. I don't think that's a good idea. This is just a map showing the forest cover in the Northeast, a lot of green there. But what's really important is the carbon density. This is a US Forest Service map. And these I translated these numbers into tons per acre. And you can see Western Massachusetts is part of the most carbon dense area. Uh, it, it, there's also a carbon dense area over here in the Adirondacks. But this is the largest carbon dense area in all of the Northeast United States. And it is three times the carbon density as that of Maine, where the forests have never been allowed to grow, get, get very large. Uh, they've been harvested so much. And um, this is a map that was put together by the, Wood, the, the Woodwell Climate people, uh, just showing the above ground density of forests. The yellow is the most dense, and you can see where that is. It's really on, on the, just you know, in the Quabbin region and then uh, patches of it west of the Connecticut River. And then the next most dense is out here, the dark blue, which is, I wish they'd done it in red or something. Those are the urban areas. And um, you can see that there's a lot of carbon density in Massachusetts. And then if you look at um, uh, the um, density changes between 2003 and 2017, you can see a lot of it is in those carbon dense areas all along here, um, uh, uh, just west of the Connecticut River, all around here in the Quabbin region. This straight line here is actually when the uh, when that dreccia or that uh, straight line tornado tore across uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I think it was in 2011, and just left a, a trail of lower carbon density by knocking down lots of trees. Um, so this is just showing the gains and the net change and the losses. And you see the losses are increasing. Going down means that there are more losses. The gains have been going down and then kind of leveling off. So the net changes have been going down. Uh, so we need to, we need to uh, uh, change that situation. I've done a lot of work with uh, uh, Dr. Beverly Law out at Oregon State University, and we've published this little piece in the conversation. It's based on some research articles we've published together. Keeping trees in the ground where they are already growing is an effective low-tech way to slow climate change because it's absorbing carbon. So here is me standing here in the Mohawk Trail State Forest next to one of the giant trees that holds a lot of carbon, a lot of carbon. So planting trees is good, no question about it, but letting them grow is better. And we um, published a paper in uh, 2019 where we just realized that there was a name for planting trees, which is afforestation, and a, a name for replanting trees, reforestation, but there wasn't a name for letting forest grow. And so we coined the term proforestation. And so it's, um, uh, Letting some forest grow allows the forest to reach their ecological potential for carbon accumulation in trees and in soils. And in these older forests, there can be as much carbon in the soils that's been accumulated as there is in the trees. And so the, the larger and older the trees are, the more carbon they store and the more there is in the soils around them. So a, a tree, by the way, is roughly half by weight carbon. And I came across this wonderful uh, figure somebody put, put out uh, de defining proforestation, uh, that you go from a degraded forest to a secondary forest, uh, and then uh, it begins to take on the characteristics of a primary forest or a forest that has not been, been harvested. And um, so they accumulate more than plant new planted trees because there are no emissions associated with harvesting. 
and the mortality rates are lower because uh, than if newly planted trees because they're already established. So they and they already hold a lot of carbon. So here, here's just an example from work that, that Bob Leverett did in measuring uh, forest in the Mohawk Trail State State Forest. So if you take a, a white pine stand, uh, you know it, it's about 22 tons per acre, and um, and if you um, harvest it, it goes to zero. <laughs> uh, if you let it uh, go back for 50 years, you're back to where you started. But if you'd let it grow, it would have more than twice as much as it had at 50 years. And if you repeat this again uh, in the next uh, period, you harvest it and then let it regrow, you're back to 22 or if you would let it continue growing, it would be 76. So this is why the, pro, the, the proforestation is basically the tops of these bars. And the, bottom, the, the red line is the sustainable management of these forests. And um, if they're covered with, with solar panels, you never get the 22 tons back. Um, this is just showing a study that uh, <clears throat> that Bev Law did out in, <clears throat> in the state of Oregon, um, where they looked at all the places they could plant trees and compared that with reforesting these clear cuts that are here, or instead using a reduced harvest where you took just if you reduce the harvest on half of the national forests out there, you just you just didn't cut half of them and you let the other half continue growing. In other words, proforestation. You can see that by 2100, there would be 10 times as much in the in the proforestation management as there is in planting new trees, and roughly three times as much as in reforestation. All good things to do, but not nearly as good as letting some, in this case, half of the trees continue to grow. So forests are too valuable to eliminate them for other purposes because Forests accumulate carbon, but that's not all they do. They, as, as the world is getting warmer, we need cooling. And forests cool the surrounding regions through their evaporative cooling. And of course, their shade locally, but their evaporative cooling for a region much larger than the forest itself. Um, uh, forest uh, clean uh, water. Oh, and I, I, and I neglected to put in here, uh, uh, the evaporative cooling also um, uh, reduces flooding. And with global warming, we're getting more intense precipitation events. We all know that. And so by evaporating that water, there's less runoff and therefore there's less flooding. And uh, forests uh, purify water, they clean the air, they reduce soil erosion. And because forests are themselves biodiverse ecosystems, they are conserving biodiversity. So clear cutting and putting in solar panels does none of these things. It provides zero carbon electricity, and that's a great thing to do. So we need a strategy for having forests and solar. And, we, and my suggestion is we set some priorities for solar and incentivize them appropriately. Right now we are incentivizing because there's a huge sub, uh, subsidy for cutting down forests. And the landowner gets the, gets the revenue from, the, from the, the wood that's harvested and then gets uh, a, 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 the, the um, production of electricity gets a very high rate, uh, which is the strange thing. Right now, solar electricity is cheaper than generating it any other way, but if you want to get it and say you want to buy it, you have to pay more for it to give the subsidies to incentivize um, putting in the solar panels. So this is my, prior, my, my set of priorities. The highest priority is for rooftops of homes, buildings, box stores, and abandoned malls and parking garages. The second priority is landfills, toxic waste, brownfields, disturbed and degraded lands, such as gravel pits and abandoned fields. Brownfields are those toxic lands that are so expensive to clean up that we won't ever do it. We have a number of those in Massachusetts that don't have solar panels on them. The next are road and railroad rights of way and other available lands. Though there is, I mean, I, I know along uh, Route 2 in Concord, uh, there are uh, panels on uh, some, uh, some, some uh, former landfills there. And then if you go um, uh, further west uh, along the Mass Turnpike, there are in the right of way, there are solar panels. 
And we have miles and miles of highway rights of way, which are public lands already, which would reduce the cost of installing them there. And then it's always argued that uh, rooftop solar is more expensive. And part of that is because of what are called the soft costs. The cost of the panels is really small. It's only about a third of the total cost you pay to have them put on your roof. And part of that is because of the regulations we have in Massachusetts that require a huge expenditure in terms of permits and all kinds of things that you have to do and that the, the installer has to do, which are totally unnecessary. Our soft costs in the United States are roughly, and in Massachusetts, are roughly twice as much as those in Germany. And the same panels go on the same roofs. And then encourage uh, community solar, uh, which means finding an area that is uh, a piece of degraded land somewhere and a, and, and, and a, a dozen or a hundred households get together and, um, and put money into it and build it there. It's in the community and it's, um, it's, it, it, it provides uh, the, the, and they get the, the credits for the equivalent amount of solar that's produced. And this is just a picture of my home, which has solar panels on the roof and back here on the shed. And it's a zero net energy home um, that it uses 84% less energy for heat and hot water than code. Um, it's grid connected, so there's net electricity exported. Three years ago, I bought an electric vehicle. We added a few more panels and uh, I get about uh, uh, two thirds or about 7,000 miles of driving from my own uh, charge from my own solar panels. Um, the annual energy needs are just completely met that way. There are no carbon dioxide emissions. So to conclude, we can have both forests and soils uh, and solar panels rather both forests and solar panels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation and, and your response. Um, next, I want to pass it to um, Meg Sheehan. Welcome to the forum. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you for, for being here. She's perfect. You're welcome. Um, so I think um, we, we'd love to hear your presentation. And I think we just wanted to kick off a little bit, um, especially after hearing Bill's presentation and seeing that map of how important um, our forests are for carbon sequestration for the whole region. Um, can you speak a little bit about the types of projects that you've seen in your work as an environmental attorney and how they've impacted regional towns and ecosystems? Sure, and I'd be happy to share my screen. I have a few photos and I'll also be talking about the policies and subsidies for these projects. Let's see. Please do. Okay. Thanks. So my name is Meg Sheehan. I am from Save the Pine Barrens. We are um, an organization based in southeastern Massachusetts, where there are one of three globally rare pine barrens ecosystems um, called an Atlantic coastal pine barren forest made up of scrub oak and pitch pine. Our mission is to protect, steward, and preserve land and water in southeastern Mass. The biggest threat to our forest biodiversity, our water, in southeastern Mass is deforestation, loss of wetlands and waterways for ground-mounted solar projects that denude the land and often are accompanied by sand mining, which strips the land to the point where nothing can grow again in human time. A recent study by Mass Audubon and Clark University shows that as of 2020, 4,000 forested acres have been lost in Massachusetts and another 150,000 more are threatened by ground mounted industrial scale solar under the state's new climate law. And just to give an idea of what some of these projects look like in Southeastern Mass, they come in and they fell a bunch, all the trees strip off 11,000 years of soils. We have very sandy acidic soils um, in Southeastern Mass and it has taken tens of thousands of years for the soils to build up a huge loss of carbon, carbon bomb from stripping the soil. And um, we are, have ended up with hundreds and hundreds of acres of projects like this in what was once a globally rare coastal plain pine barrens ecosystem. 
This is in the towns of Carver, Wareham, Plymouth. Basically, that's the area I'm talking about. So this is completely unnecessary. Studies show that 80% of US energy needs can be met by solar on rooftops. Some of the other locations that Bill's ta Bill talked about, we have 24,000 miles of transmission corridors in Massachusetts that can be used for solar siting. We can conserve, we can use less, and we can, we can become more energy efficient. I'd like to talk about the collision between energy policy that subsidizes these disastrous projects and land use planning. I think as probably most of us know in this call, local governments are on the front lines of this assault by the industrial ground mounted solar multinational for-profit cor corporations who are saying that they're helping the planet when they're actually destroying it. First, I will talk about the energy policy, then I'll talk about land use policy and laws here in Massachusetts. So what's driving the mandate for renewable energy? What is renewable energy? Well, Massachusetts has chapter 25A, a 1990s era law. That is the renewable portfolio standard. Many states have this. It requires electricity suppliers, our power companies, to sell a certain percent of electricity to us. They can generate it themselves or they can buy renewable, renewable energy credits from renewable energy generators like the ground mounted solar projects by Next Sun, AMP and others that are blighting our state. This is where the proposals and contracts come in, the buying and selling of RECs and this electricity. So how does the renewable portfolio standard define renewable? Well, very broadly, and it doesn't distinguish when it comes to solar, between ground mounted solar that destroys forests and solar on rooftop or cooperative solar projects, things like that, that are less destructive. That's the first place we should focus on when we wanna change the law to de better define what renewable energy is when it comes to solar. Next, we have the state's next generation roadmap cl map climate law that was adopted in 2021 recently. It's the major, first major update to our climate law since the 2008 Global Warming Solutions Act. It increases the required percentage of electricity that has to come from renewable sources. Again, that word renewable. This will be increasing the mandates to the electricity suppliers 3% annually from 2025 to 2029 to reach 40% by 2030. Next, we have the Department of Energy Resources, SMART, they call it, SMART Solar Subsidy Program, a set of regulations that purport to ensure that solar is properly cited, and it sets different levels of subsidies for different types of solar projects. Dual use, which is um, solar on farmland, floating solar, et cetera. I can assure you that the regulations do not accomplish this goal. They are a complete disaster. They've been amended a couple of times, supplemented with unenforceable guidelines on solar siting when it comes to agriculture and biomap two habitat, et cetera. This is really being done recklessly, subsidizing and approving these projects. DOER issues statements of qualifications and pre-approve these projects. One of the biggest disasters, which is almost unimaginable, is here in Carver, Massachusetts, where there is a Pine Gate Renewable at Next Sun project, about 100 acres of so-called dual use solar on cranberry bogs, 3,000 over 3,000 timber poles treated with copper chromated arsenic have been driven into the groundwater and soils on cranberry bogs. This was approved by the Local Conservation Commission and Planning Board, again on the front lines. The state has disavowed any responsibility for this, pro this disaster, even though they're subsidizing it and approving it. Due to public outcry, the poles are now being removed because Pine Gate Renewables has tested the soil and groundwater and found arsenic and cro uh, uh, chromated copper. And this is Again, being done on the local level, it's a $53 million project, one of three that are in play right now. So this is what we're doing with our clean energy money. Then we have also DOER's climate roadmap um, and clean energy climate plan for the 2030 
energy pathway for getting to net zero by 2050, whatever that is. Uh, the roadmap is riddled with inconsistencies when it comes to forests. It applauds their role in sequestering carbon, but then calls for quote unquote, consuming 158,000 acres of land in Massachusetts for energy generation, primarily for large industrial scale ground mounted solar. Um, the roadmap will reduce the amount of forested land in Massachusetts by five to 8% in 29 years. The, pro the roadmap then says that this is okay because the remaining trees will keep growing and sequestering carbon. Well, they also say we need technological fixes that will solve all our problems, ones that are not deployable at scale this time, like carbon capture and sequestration. So the big question is, the roadmap admits that we need more study about the impacts of solar on forests, but at the same time, DOER is approving massive projects like this $53 million disaster with arsenic poisoning our groundwater in Southeastern Mass. That's why we're calling for a moratorium on these subsidies. And at the end, I'll give you a link to our moratorium petition. So then all of this collides with our principles of land use control and planning. Nationally, in the United States, the broadest discretion and the greatest power to affect land use is presently exercised by local governments through zoning and home rule powers. We know that through our planning boards, our conservation commissions, et cetera. Uh, we have chapter 43B, our Home Rule Procedures Act, and we also have our Zoning Enabling Act, which is chapter 40A, section 1A, that talks about the wide discretion that's given to, and powers that are given to cities and towns to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of present and future inhabitants. So in 1985, we have the solar disaster by law, uh, zoning law that came in. In 1985, our zoning law was amended to add section three, which says that no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar systems or the building of structures of solar, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. This was 1985. There was no such thing as the industrial ground mounted solar project, uh, private corporate. Uh, infrastructure projects that we're seeing now. There was no such battery thing as the battery storage they're seeing now. That bylaw was intended to address residential solar. Um, in the meantime, most but not all municipalities in Massachusetts have solar bylaws. But this section three is being used by developers to push back against the ability of municipalities to exercise their local land use control. Um, in 1985, when this Section 3 was adopted, it was before all the subsidy programs, the SMART program, the Global Warming Solutions Act, and the Green Jobs Bill, etc. Fortunately, work is underway to change Section 3 of Chapter 40A. In December of 2021, bills were filed in the legislature to amend the statute to expand the reasons why municipalities can regulate solar and that's for the protection of forest, agriculture, and wetlands. Those are Senate 2846 and House 4607. In addition, the state's highest court is recognizing this clash, this collision, and right now it has in front of it a case that is going to address the powers of municipalities to regulate solar. And they are seeking amicus briefs, that's friend of the court briefs, from municipalities and from anyone in the state of Massachusetts. So we hope that you will join us in submitting briefs to the court, telling them why we should be able to regulate these projects in order to protect our communities and the environment. On the state level, the agencies that are supposed to be requiring environmental review and helping us to address the proper siting of solar and protect our forests and our water is the state Massachusetts Environmental uh, Policy Act unit in the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, NEPA. This agency is taking the position that these projects are exempt 
from MEPA, even though they meet the thresholds. And if it was any other type of project, they would re be required to do an environmental review. Our state agencies, Mass Wildlife and DAP are doing nothing. I can attest to that based on the hundreds of projects that I have, well, dozens of projects that I have reviewed. Local conservation projects, uh, commissions are being faced with these projects. The Wetlands Protection Act is inadequate to provide for mitigation. And oftentimes what we're seeing is no wetlands mitigation at all being required because the communities, the conservation commissions are accepting the story from the developers, from the solar companies, that even though they're clear cutting forests and stripping away carbon sequestering soils, this is clean energy, so we don't need to mitigate anything. So with that, I'll wrap up. I'll say, I hope everyone stays involved. I hope you'll consider signing our moratorium petition. This was put together by our statewide coalition of folks from Western Mass and across the state to ask the governor to put a hold on any subsidies for ground mounted solar. It's on Action Network, you can find that. And I hope you'll join the effort to submit an amicus brief to the SJC to ensure that local zoning isn't curtailed when it comes to solar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg. And um, what we can do is we can share a link to the petition and some of the information that you have there. Um, we'll send out a follow up email to everyone who's joined our call today, and we can share some of that information. Um, and just a reminder before we get to our next video, um, if people have questions for Meg, for Bill, or for any of our forum speakers, um, please remember to put them in the chat. You can direct them at Carlos Fontes. He'll be taking them down and then we'll try to have our amazing panelists get to as many of those questions as possible. And of course, if you wanna get involved, um, we have our smart solar coalitions, whether you're from Shootsbury or Amherst, um, please, um, you can put your name in the chat, you can sign the petition. And of course, we'll be following up over email to see um, who, wants, who wants to get involved, to get more involved in taking a look at these projects. Um, next, I will, um, we're going to share a video um, from um, that we took uh, with Emily Cohen um, to show sort of a more personal look at what these projects can look like. Um, I'll just ask everyone if you could please turn your volume up so that you can hear the, um, the, the sound from the video. So if you're listening now, please turn the volume up um, so that we can make sure that you can hear it and go right ahead. My name is Emily Cohen. I live in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. We have a 34 acre parcel here. We were notified that as a butter, we could attend this proposal meeting, a solar field being put in on the forestry land uh, behind our house. It was a very slick presentation. We were assured that all our concerns would be, you know, taken into account. The site where the the solar field was planned, and I think it's a 17 acre so solar field, was located right above our property. Um, so any any water that came down from the solar panels would come through our property and towards the Mill River. So there were concerns about wetland and stormwater management, and that was all written up in the plans that the, the install company was supposed to use as a guide. Yeah, all they've been trucking in. So this was a really deep, this is where the trees have yeah. fallen. Yeah, there were like 30 big trees that were all kicked off. There was no kind of like officially informing us that major damage had happened on our property. We just happened to find out. And basically they had set up a big, huge drainage pipe from their solar field up above that concentrated all the storm water into this one pipe. It, it just went pouring down, ripping through our property towards the river, and on the way creating these very deep chasms. Our trees just fell into these chasms, maybe 30 trees in one chasm, plus there were two or three other chasms. And then the water and the sand all got deposited down in this wetland area on the way to the river, and then a lot of the sand also went into the river.
by the time we found out that it had even happened, the Department of Environmental Protection had been notified and was involved. Eventually it went to the Attorney General's office and the case got even bigger. It came to light that there were multiple violations that led to that event. Most of those violations involved Dynamic Energy, who was the solar install company, not following the written plan for stormwater management. But in addition, there were some violations on the part of Hall Forestry, who's the, the landowner that was leasing the solar field out. They quote unquote, removed all marketable sand prior to installing the solar panels. So that made it even more likely that it was just gonna be excess runoff heading down onto our property and the river. We were basically told by DEP there was gonna to need to be all kinds of remediation of our land and the damage to take away all the, the deep deposits of sand on the wetland. Um, Ted, Ted spoke to them and said, you need to come and do some independent monitoring of the remediation here. And then he also said, you know, while we're at it, could you try to prevent this happening in Amherst, Shootsbury, Pelham, can you, you know, is there anything you can do? And he was like, no, we don't have any jurisdiction over forests, only river and wetland. And we, we're, you know, we don't get involved until there's been a, a violation. <laughs> like they have to wait for the disaster to get involved. That's how the system works. Which led us to wonder, is there somebody else that's in charge of protecting the forests if it's not them? It's been very invasive. There's flags everywhere and there were pipes everywhere and rebar and people having access to come on the land whenever they want and workmen. And so it's been a significant, um, it's interfered significantly with our enjoyment of of the land in the woods. We had really clear um, things that we were okay with and not okay with, like we didn't want really massive equipment in the woods. It was supposed to be a six foot bobcat, but they, that's what they brought. And it seems like things got lost in the process as far as our wishes. The size of the excavator then dictated them needing to cut a lot of more trees to make space for their massive excavator to do the job. So it's now turning into a second phase of destruction that we're experiencing on our land. This is what they're supposed to have removed, which they think they've already removed. It's still, you know, further than that of exactly what they think shouldn't be here. It's all back. It seems like a lot of hubris to imagine that you could fix that. Yeah. Now the area that's been disturbed by the remediation is at least twice the size of the original disturbed area, and they're not done yet. I can't count the number of hours that we've had to be in meetings and you know going over legal documents, walking in the woods, flagging trees, monitoring, checking what happens after every rainstorm, reporting to people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's been significant. You know, even though the individuals at different points along the way have been very conciliatory and oh, we want to take your needs into account and stuff, but the way that it actually works with all the different entities and all the companies and all the way that they're used to working, etc., what's efficient for them, is, the result is that, um, you know, it's a very significant impact on our land and on our lives and not something that we really signed up for. These companies that come in, this company of Dynamic that did the install here, they can make it sound great with their glossy presentation to the town and make it seem appealing, like you're gonna get some tax credits to the town or whatever benefits, but they don't live near in Western Mass, they're from another state. They're not gonna be able to anticipate every problem that happens. They didn't even follow their own plan. There's so many things that can go wrong and they don't always do what they say they're gonna do. You know. We're pro solar power. You can probably see we have solar panels all over our roof, solar hot water. It just doesn't belong in the woods.
So thank you so much, Emily. And I just wanted to see if, if you had a couple words that you wanted to add after um, sharing the video. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a few more things I wanted to add um, that I'll just read here. So number one, industrial solar installations should not be built in or above forests, wetlands, watersheds, or towns, water sources. There, it's, it's not just about the forest that has to be clear cut to install the solar um, arrays. They disrupt everything downhill from them in terms of water, erosion, sediment, permanent alterations of the ecosystem, and so on. The proposed solar projects in Amherst and Shutesbury are not just potentially impacting 50 acres times five, where the clear cutting would be for the solar panels. The destruction can reach a lot further than that. And as I know personally at this point, <laughs> um, and it can go as far as the, you know, as the water flows. Um, number two, once a disaster occurs downstream or downhill from an industrial solar site, none of the options for the town or the landowner are very good. The Department of, so DEP will only get involved if the disaster included a river or wetland. And if they do get involved, the remediation that they mandate may leave the land even more disturbed and you don't have much control over how that goes. If your disaster doesn't happen to be within DEP's jurisdiction, then you're on your own to go up against a big for-profit company with their team of lawyers. Neither is a good option, and your only real protection is to avoid the disaster happening in the first place by having strong bylaws in your town that only permit solar projects that don't risk damage to your forests and adjacent ecosystems. Number three, once these huge solar companies get permission to do these industrial scale projects in our small towns, we become disempowered. Their objectives are very different from ours. They're in it to make a profit, not to protect our ecosystem. In our situation, there was no adequate independent monitoring or oversight of the project. The solar install company was up there in the woods, blatantly disregarding their stormwater management plan, and no one was there to make them comply. We need to recognize that as small towns and communities, we need to say no to projects that are risky at best and destructive at worst. And if we decide that it is in our best interest to say yes to an industrial scale solar project, it shouldn't be in the woods and it should be written into the bylaws and contract that the company pays for an independent monitor whom the town chooses and hires to make sure that the construction is done according to an agreed upon plan. And finally, if you allow your forest to get damaged like ours, it will never regenerate to its former healthy state in your lifetime. And you will also never get back the time that you will have to spend fighting to get it even partially restored. Better to prevent your precious land and forests from getting damaged in the first place. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Emily, and thank you for your words and for sharing some of your personal experience um, as an abutter. And I'm sure if um, we'll have many questions for you. Um, I also just um, noticed in Emily's presentation that the project that she was describing was 17 acres. Um, and the proposed project in Shutesbury, Shutesbury is a total of three, over 360 acres, affected acres. Um, so definitely something to think about when considering scale. Um, I now wanted to pass it over to Marianne Connor from Co-op Power. Um, we've heard a little bit about um, we've heard a little bit about um, industrial solar, um, and Marianne's going to talk about other models of solar. So um, Marianne, um, please share with us what, what are some other models of, of solar power that we can build in our town. Thank you, Marlena. Um, wow, uh, Emily, that was just such a compelling presentation. It's it's heartbreaking. Um, so I live at the uh, a serious intentional community and eco village in Shutesbury, Massachusetts. So I actually first got in, involved with this uh, when I started going to the hearings around what AMP was proposing. Um, and then he became interim manager of Co-op Power. 
which is a multi-race, multi-class, uh, uh, intergenerational cooperative movement for what we call community-led, community-owned solar. We're, we believe strongly in the idea of that solar development should be also a movement towards a shift in, in power so that communities uh, for energy security and energy sovereignty own their own power generation. Um, Remy, do you have my slides or do you want me to try to bring them up? Sure, I can share your slides. Thanks. So as I just said, Co-op Power is a regional network of community energy cooperatives. So we are a network of um, cooperatives that usually form from a group of people who are uh, either, like in Massachusetts, are wanted to find some um, really smart, smart way to do solar uh, and then reach out to us and we help people in the development, financing, and building of uh, appropriately sized community-led solar arrays, that the cooperative that forms governs the process and eventually within seven to 10 years actually owns the array. Um, so we have five uh, CECs, the Community Energy Co-ops we call CECs. In Massachusetts, we have one in New York City um, and we're growing. We have two and uh, new ones in up in in New York. Well, up not that upstate, but in New York State, uh, one in Maine. I'm now talking to some people in Gloucester, and we have one forming in New Jersey. So it really is very much a kind of um, grassroots. Like the communities reach out to us, we work with them to find appropriate sites for solar construction on built environments not we don't take out forests <laughs> i live it i live it serious we we take our forests very seriously here um and we find ways for them to be able to finance and eventually own those projects okay next slide Uh, I just wanted to share in terms of a, a, a project I'm very proud of last year, we uh, were able to put um, over 112 megawatts of, of solar power on 40 low income housing authority, um, low income building, buildings for low income housing in New York City last year. Um, and we uh, was were able to do some green job development for for the people who installed it. So we work very hard for to have the, a model that is that considers of, that the community owns it. Eventually, that we do green job development, so people are learning how to create a green economy as we go and we so we're really working to try to come up with a model that is both in, at the intersection of of social justice and um and renewable energy next slide uh so uh, we also trained so a lot of the, we we actually hired people who lived in those houses in the um affordable houses and we trained 20 of the residents of those houses in the process of becoming solar installers during that process. And this is a, a large community solar array, meaning that as they, as those, array, those arrays generate electricity, it actually gets then distributed to their individual electricity bills and they got a 15% discount on their, on their bills while they were generating um, renewable energy. Co-op Power Boston, we've had uh, some initial success with well interfaith communities. They're putting solar on churches. 
Uh, and now we've uh, started doing uh, work with food co-ops. So the Dorchester Food Co-op in Boston is now putting solar on their roof. And um, this one that we have here, I'm really proud of this year in, in Western Mass. River Valley Co-op decided to, new, to build a new building in East Hampton. And they contacted us and they wanted to have um, an array that covered their, so that they could run their whole store uh, on their electricity. Um, and so they have one on their roof, but then they really went above and beyond to build this parking lot canopy array, which is a community solar project that'll generate electricity for 100 low income BIPOC uh, communities in the surrounding area. So for it, we're, it really is creating solar for all, for people who rent and who pe for people who don't own their roof or for people who couldn't afford to be part of the solar revolution. This project is generating electricity for, so that people who, who couldn't do solar can now participate in the solar revolution. Oh, and I'm also very proud of the idea that this, because we are a cooperative movement, which means we're um, member owned, we started uh, PV Squared, which was the construction company that did this. They came out of co-op power more than 20 years ago. So this was actually also a great partnerships, par partnership of cooperatives. Co-op power worked with River Valley Co-op and then PV Squared was the installer. So, um, in terms of doing economic justice, the, the cooperative movement really seeks to have member owner organizations also construct and work on all of our projects. Next slide. And just to be clear, when people say community shared solar, I just wanted to have this slide in case, and so that's clear. So it, it tends to be, um, not just like you, you like you put solar on your home, but it's a way for households to join a single shared solar energy system at, that generates credits, and then those credits go through the utility and onto people's bills directly. So again, it's a, a way for people who couldn't afford or don't own roofs or other environments to be part of the solar revolution. Uh, and here's just quickly the the idea of um, how co the cooperative approach to community owned solar works uh, that we uh, bring in member owners to co-op power. Uh, so we invest in that when you become a, mo uh, a member, part of your membership is equity that we pool together to invest in the development um, and design and then eventually putting together the tax equity investor, investors to finance and build community solar arrays. So we are a um, consumer uh, co-op, but also a, an investment co-op co in which we're working together to pool our financial resources and our technical understanding to really lead a new model for, of environmental justice. Uh, and anyone who wants to reach out for me, I can put my um, my uh, uh, email in the chat. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, and so anyone who is interested in learning more about co-op power, um, we are hoping to work with Marianne and uh, co-op power to schedule some education sessions, some learning sessions to see if co-op power is right for um, any of the number of communities that are represented on this call. Um, and of course, you're welcome to email um, Marianne, her email's in the chat, and we will also share more information in our follow-up email. Um, as well, so we can make sure that we're all connected. 
So we wanted to move on to some of the incredible questions that we have gotten. But before we did that, um, we know that some people um, need to log off because we're an hour and 15 minutes out. So before we let everyone go, we just wanted to make a quick um, plug for Smart Solar Shootsbury so you know who, who we are and, and you can connect with us. So I'll just turn it over to Sharon um, very quickly, who's just going to tell you a little bit about Smart Solar Shootsbury, and then we will go back to the questions for our panelists. Um, Sharon, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for attending today and thank you so much to our speakers and a big thank you to our small but mighty group the smart solar shoots Ferry, and also the coalition of smart solar western mass um, which includes all the towns in western mass we're going to move to questions and answers but i'd like to tell you how you could get involved with our team um, one important thing is we're having an, an open meeting on December 19th at five o'clock. Everything I'm going to tell you is going to be sent to you with live links in an email. So don't worry about writing it down right now, along with the petition that was mentioned earlier and the how to get in, in touch with co-op power. Um, yeah, so the open meeting and also visiting our website that um, you can sign up to our newsletter in order to get informed about upcoming important meetings for us to attend, um, as well as other events. And you can sign up for that email list. Um, you can also, we'll give you our email and you can send us emails with questions. Uh, you can get a yard sign. Um, we would love to see the yard sign spread all around. They've really helped to get the conversation going. So uh, I put into the chat where you can get yard signs, we have two locations. Um, and also, if you'd like to continue the conversation online, we have a Facebook page, we'll be sending you the link to the Facebook page. We'd also like to ask for donations, the yard signs cost us $10 each. And um, so if you get a yard sign, um, that would be great if you could um, make a $10 or more donation. Um, but we're also hiring a hydrologist and environmental lawyer, and we're accepting much bigger donations if you can help with that. If you'd like to make a tax exempt donation, we've partnered with a 5013C to make that possible. But any amount helps. Um, and we'd love for you to um, get involved to try to ward off any more of this disastrous destruction that's sort of looming over our towns. So that's it and thank you. I think I'll send it back to Marlena and uh, we'll go on to some of Oops, sorry. We'll go on to the questions and our panelists will answer it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we had a question for uh, Bill Muma. Um, and of course, any panelists who wants to weigh in, please do. Um, but Bill, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but how could, um, how would the, the current local climate change if trees are replaced by solar panels? Um, and could deforestation contribute to vulnerability in relation to forest fires now or in the future? Well, if we, <clears throat> I mean, our our um, here's the tragic tragedy of all this. If 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 we allow climate change to get lots worse, it will destroy our forests, among other things. So so our forests are right now very much on our side. The um, uh, the IPCC report that came out in in uh, August pointed out that for the past six decades. Natural systems, forests and oceans have been, and wetlands and so on, have been taking out 56% uh, uh, of what we put in every year. Imagine where we'd be without that. Show me a technology that's doing better than that. There are none, and there can, and there will never be any that will be better than that. And we are, meanwhile, degrading these systems. So I think it's absolutely critical uh, that we. Um, um, that, that we that we protect our forests and uh, and that we um, we don't you know I, I was just so 
so powerfully moved by that uh, video. I mean, it's just incredible that something like that could happen and that that isn't against the law. I mean, the fact is that it's being aided and abetted and subsidized by our state government. I think we ought to mount a huge campaign of letting them know that this is unacceptable. It is beyond unacceptable. Um, so um, uh, there are people on here like Meg and so on who know much better than I do sort of what, what can be done legally. Uh, but uh, whatever can be done, we, I, I think we should all unite behind this effort. Uh, and, uh, you know, and as a solar advocate, it just pains me to see these big companies come in and destroy the support for solar energy, which is what it's doing. Uh, that's just, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, Mariano is very impressed with your presentation about a co-op and how it is doing things and engaging people and getting things done and pulling people out of poverty and making their lives better. Um, this is certainly not what is happening with these big installations. Well, I think, Bill, your your question is a perfect, um, your statement is a perfect question and to lead in into another question we have that I think we want to ask Meg. Um, how can we legally, how can we legally protect forests on private land when landowners have their rights and are subsidized by the state to clear for solar installations? Um, and I think uh, another question that has come up that I think you partially answered in your presentation, but maybe you want to discuss um, again is just how that also interacts with um, the the um, sort of the legal process against uh, local moratoriums or limitations on solar projects. So it's sort of a two part question. Um, how can we legally protect forests on private land when landowners have their rights? and are subsidized by the state to clear for solar in installations? And then how do we um, protect our town that has a bylaw if they're being threatened by a lawsuit um, by a company that wants to build? Two big um, ones. Okay. All right, great. Well, I think the first question actually answers its own question um, because it's really not a question of, you know, legally telling a landowner what they can or cannot do. Of course, we do have local zoning that will require site plan review and setbacks and buffers and you know a wetlands law that's supposed to be enforced but isn't as Emily showed us. So the question really is um, why are the subsidies going to this? And it's not so much a legal question, it's a political question. And to Bill, Bill's point, what we do need to be doing is storming the state house as we have been doing and starting to do um, and letting our legislators and our regulators at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs know that it is unacceptable to shovel these subsidies out the door through the Smart Solar Program at DOER. Um, we, you can call up Eric Seltzer and tell him that he should be um, directing those taxpayer and ratepayer subsidies to forest protection and land protection. You know, in Southeastern Mass, we have the dying cranberry industry that is on life support with taxpayer and ratepayer subsidies. And the, as they call it, the solar predators are knocking on their doors, leasing their land for 20 years to put on solar. Um, and so why aren't those solar subsidies going to protecting our wetlands and um, preserving our forests instead of destroying them. So that's how I'd ask, answer the first question. And the second question um, on the legal powers of local municipalities to exercise their historic and traditional land use powers, which have been recognized by the United States Supreme Court going back to the 1920s, is um, again, getting behind the effort to change Chapter 40A, we have a bill that's been filed, pushing that through, making sure that the legislators know that this preferential treatment for solar under the zoning laws is based on outdated information and to let them know that we're in a climate crisis and they shouldn't be subsidizing uh, this through the zoning laws. Thank, thank you, Meg. Um, yep. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to see, we got a couple questions on wetlands um, and how these types of projects can affect uh, wetlands. We know that we have a lot of um, area uh, here in Shootsbury that is considered wetlands um, and many of them are adjacent or close to some of the proposed projects. And so I don't know if um, Bill or Meg or Emily can just talk a little bit about the impact that some of these projects could have on wetlands and um, are wetlands important to mitigating climate change? Well, I can answer the last part right up front. Uh, you know, globally, wetlands are only about five or six percent of the total land area, but they hold 30 percent of the soil carbon in the world or in that small amount of wetlands. We've destroyed over half our wetlands here in the, the Northeast US. Um, and um, why we keep doing this? Well, it's, it, it's, for, it's for profit. It's only for profit. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's hugely important that we, um, as I said, there is no other technology that is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and there will not be one in time, even if it's invented, uh, to, to make the difference that we have to have. So we have to keep protecting these natural systems. And we should call them uh, nature's solutions, not nature-based solutions, because that's used then by uh, the, um, the companies to say, oh, we're cutting down trees, and that's part of our nature-based nature, nature -based solution. Uh, these are these are these are nature solutions, and and we have to just you know nature is defenseless against this onslaught unless we stand up and and uh, protect her. So let's I, I just you know the incompetence of our state government and maybe it's worse than incompetence maybe it's malicious, but whatever it is it needs to be addressed. Thank you, Bill. I don't know if um, Meg or Emily wanted to add anything to that. Sure, I never, I'll never, never miss a chance to let everyone know that I think our laws on being in forest, Bill called it incompetence. Um, you know, we have a great Wetlands Protection Act, um, yeah. but what we just witnessed in that video shows that our laws aren't being enforced. And, and why it's really important for people to get involved on their local conservation commissions, say no to these projects. I know we have some folks from Wareham on the call. That conservation commission actually said no to a solar project. It was going to be altering and filling a cranberry bog, which is a wetland under the town's local bylaw. It would be a construction, it would be construction in a wetland. Maybe that's going to go to court and the developer will appeal it, but you know, we have these laws and we just need to use them. Um, thank you. I don't know if Emily, if you had anything you wanted to add or we can move to the next question. All right, um, we, can, we can move to the next question. Um, so one of the questions, um, I'm not sure if anyone on the panel can answer this, but one of the questions that we got was, um, is there any effort um, right now to, sorry, just give me one moment, um, to, uh, to re rematriate um, Massachusetts conversation lands to indigenous stewards? Um, considering um, the ineffectiveness of our state and local conservation agencies to effectively steward forest and wetland resources. Um, do any of the panelists know if there have been efforts or proposals to rematriate uh, conservation lands to indigenous stewards? Is anyone aware of any efforts like that? I could talk about that a little bit. Um, I think maybe the question is to repatriate conservation lands. Um, I know that there are efforts to involve Indigenous community members in Southeastern Mass and on Cape Cod 
in land conservation, we have the Native Land Conservancy in Mashpee, which is the only uh, native led land conservancy east of the Mississippi. So there is a lot of conversation about that. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of work being done on traditional indigenous knowledge, ecological, ecological knowledge. Maybe someone on the call can speak more to that, but that's what I would offer. I, I don't, I don't know, but it's a great question. And I mean, it, interesting grounds for a, a kind of political lawsuit about how the lands are being used. And um, I don't know, I, I just think it's a great political question. So we had, we had another question that was, um, I think, sort of Two, sort of a two-part question, I think they're related, um, that is uh, looking at building solar on other types of lands, which I think Bill talked a little bit about. Um, so the question was um, from Brenda, um, have there been studies performed to identify the quantity of acreage for solar arrays available in Massachusetts, private and public, on building rooftops, uh, brownfields, old malls, um, et cetera? Um, and then the other question, this one I think was for Meg, was that won't a moratorium on ground mounted solar discourage parking lot canopy projects? So it's sort of a two part about if we're going to put up, you know, solar projects other places, how does that work and how would a moratorium potentially affect that? So that first question, I think somebody asked in the chat. Um, the state is working on some kind of spatial study survey, something or other about how much acreage there is. And I know those numbers are out there and Mass Audubon knows this as well. Our moratorium is, um, it has nothing to do with already a built environment. It's directed solely towards um, ground mounted solar that will clear cut forests, fill in wetlands, destroy rivers, et cetera. So yeah, we're obviously in favor of rooftops and canopies and parking lots. I don't see it as an either or. I see I see it as as you know, we'll find that we'll find these these pieces of land that are not be, not useful for other purposes or or not forest or natural areas, and uh, we will uh, do everything we can to put more on our rooftops and and uh, elsewhere. There's um, Environment Massachusetts has a um, um, a bill managed to get a bill in that would uh, the million solar roofs initiative. All right. There's a start, and then let's change. Let's change this ridiculous system we have that makes it so expensive. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we don't have to just accept things. I guess that's the message here, isn't it? Isn't it, Meg? We don't have to accept things the way they are. You can change them. <laughs> that's that's right, Bill. I mean, I mean, you know, I hate to sound like a fourth grade interpretation of democracy, but isn't that what democracy is all about? <laughs> And also to speak to your point, Bill, about incentivizing what we really want rather than really what we yes. don't want. We so have what's being called community solar, but it's not owned by the community. It's the and it just in terms of like no one really made an argument for energy security, but you know to really with climate change, it's really important for communities to own their own generation. And not have a multinational from someplace else controlling your power. I, mean, I lived in LA during the rolling blackouts in 2000, and I saw Enron bring down the California governor. Mm -hmm. So who owns the power has the power. And it, there's like so many issues uh, around this in terms of uh, you know, really making this a political revolution as well as a, as a renewable energy one. Mm -hmm. And now I feel obligated to say, and who's got the power? We've got the power. What kind of power? People power. <laughs> <laughs> As an activist, I, I must, I, I can't um, let the opportunity we, we go also by. Do, we also do trainings for that kind of, um, for whoever asked this question. That's one of the things that we're wanting to do is to really start to educate a, uh, a volunteer uh, core of people who know how to 
look for good solar sites for built environments and kind of be our um, feet and eyes and ears in starting to build these partnerships with nonprofits, churches, community centers, co-ops, and you know people who are all aligned around this mission and really just need to know how to how to do it. So that's a great point, Marianne. And I noticed that we've been getting a lot of questions about what can be done. There's some questions about, are there local bylaws that our town can pass um, to, to protect the forest that would be acceptable um, under state law as it stands now? Um, we do have a, a bylaw in Shootsbury that I believe it limits solar projects to 15 acres. Um, and you know, we would hope that Coles AMP would respect the, you know, the interests or the sort of the stated goals of the community when they voted up that bylaw. Um, but there's a question of can there be bylaws written that would be um, acceptable under the state law until it is changed, um, which we hope it is. And then I was just hoping that maybe Emily could just say a little bit about sort of the type of presentation that was initially made. I know you discussed it in your video. Um, but sort of the questions that were or were not that you feel maybe were or were not asked or should have been specified um, a little bit more deeply um, by the town when interacting with a with a company coming in wanting to build. Um, so I guess the first question is about um, is there a bylaw that we can pass that would um, be acceptable under state law? And then we'll, we'll pivot to Emily talking a little bit about what that experience was like interacting with the company. Are you asking me? Oh, I'm sorry, Meg. Yeah, Meg, oh, do you sorry. want? <laughs> I um, should have asked yes, you. Yeah, there are bylaws. Um, there, I think about, and others might know this question better, but more than half, I believe, of the towns in Massachusetts have solar bylaws. Plymouth, for example, um, after a, a disaster there that clear cut an ancient pine barrens forest of 25 acres in an area of critical environmental concern with just a building permit. Um, we uh, passed a bylaw that limits solar to five acres and the land can't have been cleared in the last five years. I know the town of Buckland has a very strong bylaw, solar bylaw, and there's practically no ground mounted solar there. So yes, there are quite a few bylaws. And you can do a moratorium petition in the meantime. I, I, I don't know if this is, my understanding in Shootsbury is that we have pretty good bylaws. Um, I guess one of the things I hoped is if we had other um, community solar development that that AMP couldn't threaten to be like suing Shootsbury because they're like, oh, you you're holding up solar, right? So if there were you know other appropriate solar development, it would be much harder to for them to threaten that like, oh, so you, you're not letting solar happen. But I don't know, but maybe somebody else can answer that. But my understanding with Shootsbury is we have some pretty good bylaws. It's just that they keep getting threatened anyway. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Um, Emily, did you want to just talk a little bit about the experience of interacting with the presentations? Because I think um, a lot of the, you know, a, a big part of this comes down to the process, um, the process that the town has with with the company and and making you know and the presentation that the company gives to the town and you know the types of questions and and issues that are raised um, and what answers what questions are answered or not answered um, and I know that she, uh, Amherst has been interacting with this process very closely to try to get more answers to a lot of the questions they had about a proposed project. So um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah, so in our case, um, there really were only two abutters. So there were only two property owners invited to this. I can't remember, honestly, if it was a planning or a zoning board meeting with the dynamic energy, you know, giving their proposals. So there were only two of us there um, to raise concerns. And uh both of us kind of had this similar concern which was it well in our case our well and a spring a natural spring on our land were both like directly below the proposed solar array and so we were concerned about 
you know, if they were going to use herbicide or anything to like control weeds around the panels, was that going to contaminate our water? We have an organic small farm. We didn't want, you know, toxins or whatever. Um, and the guy giving the presentation kind of said like, oh yeah, sure, sure. And, and then I spoke with the people on the planning board and said, you know, can we get this in writing? And they did put it in writing, but as you can could see from our video that like that doesn't ensure anything necessarily if there's no oversight over what's happening up there. Um, but anyways, at the time that was our main concern. I mean, in our case, the site of the array above our land was in a, an abandoned gravel pit. So there wasn't all, there weren't all these questions about clear cutting. The, it was barren. Um, so, you know, in terms of potential impacts, we were thinking about, you know, toxicity, whatever. But I mean, honestly, I wasn't knowledgeable about all the things that could go wrong from a stormwater perspective. I mean, now I am because it happened, but, um, you know, I'm not a professional ecologist. I just live here. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, you know, the guy showed up in a fancy black car from, you know, he's from P Pennsylvania or, or the company's from Pennsylvania. He came from Eastern Mass. He made it all sound great. And, um, and then even after the damage happened, as I mentioned in the video, we were never notified by anybody actually that the damage had occurred on our property. Um, there was a, you know, a really severe rainstorm and we hadn't walked on the land for a few days. And so we didn't know. And that guy who'd given the, the presentation, he was sort of the PR guy. He just showed up unannounced at our house on a Sunday, drove up the driveway and said, have you noticed anything unusual in your woods? And we were like, well, no. And then after he left without disclosing what had happened, you know, we went and looked and saw what had happened. But that's that's kind of what our experience was like, you know, dealing directly with the company. And then since then, it's all been through lawyers and, you know, they get in contact when they need our consent to have people access the land and whatnot. We haven't had any further direct contact with the company since then. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you so much, Emily. And I'm, I'm noticing that there's a lot of um, information that's being shared in the chat just about the local bylaws and Shootsbury and sort of um, some of the some of the questions that had come up around that. Um, Michael did share that Shootsbury solar bylaw is considered a best practice model by the Pioneer Valley Commission in its solar best practice guide. So it it sounds like um, you know, that is that is something that's already been implemented in Shootsbury, but there's obviously uh, a lot of questions that are still are outstanding. Um, so it's nine o'clock. Uh, I do wanna um, close us out. We've been here since 7.15 and I really appreciate all 136 of you who are still on the line with us now. Um, there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered that we still need to answer. Um, and I think there's also a lot of questions about what, what can we do, what can we do, and um, I'm just going to say if, if you are interested, if you're concerned, if you want to learn more, um, I would encourage you to join your local smart solar group. If you're from Shootsbury, um, join us um, in Smart Solar Shootsbury. If you're from Amherst, you can join Smart Solar Amherst um, or any of the other Western Mass organizations. Um, you can get plugged in um, with Meg Sheehan and her group. Um, and you can also connect with Mary Ann to learn more about what are some positive solutions. Um, we know we need to build uh, solar power. Um, we know that we need to deal with the energy crisis that's coming. We also know that we desperately need forests. Um, and so we want to do both. So we just ask everyone to get involved. Um, and just to reiterate, we have um, a couple events coming up very soon that we would like you to be a part of. So we have an open meeting on um, next, um, next Sunday, which will be uh, 12 19. Monday. I'm sorry, it says Sunday in the chat. Um, so we're just going to correct that. It's next Monday, uh, 12 20 at 7 15 p.m. So uh, a week and a day from today, next Monday. 
at 7.15 p.m. Um, and I know that a lot of people on this call have a lot of their own knowledge and they've been sharing it with us. So we would love for you to come to the open meeting to share some of the information and knowledge that you have so we can continue to learn together and to take action together um, to um, protect the environment, protect our community, protect our water, fight for solar. Um, you can also reach out to Smart Solar Amherst at smartsolaramherst at gmail.com. And um, we also invite you to get a lawn sign so you, you can sh show your support for the Smart Solar Project and support the forests um, while um, on your lawn or on your yard. And um, we also encourage everyone to sign the petition. Um, Smart Solar Shootsbury has created a petition asking our town leadership um, not to make exceptions to the formal approval process for AMP Coles um, and to make sure that they are doing a full and independent environmental review before improving any project. Um, basically, we don't want to put the cart before the horse. Um, and we're also asking our town to explore small scale municipal solar. So we will put that, um, that petition right in the chat. So if you're interested in signing, you can sign it. And of course, um, for those local to Shootsbury, um, the next NRAD meeting, um, which basically looks at the scale of the project, it's um, how big the project area would be in relation to the wetlands. Um, and please excuse me if I'm butchering that, that's just my layman's understanding or laywoman's understanding of the meeting. Um, that open meeting will be on January 13th. Um, and I think that's where that discussion will be happening on the scale of the project. So if you were interested in taking a look at the process, um, please join that meeting. And I'm also seeing that there is an important Amherst planning board meeting this Wednesday at 630 to, um, to support the moratorium. So there's a lot of meetings coming up. That was a lot of information. We'll be sharing that with you over email. We're so grateful to have all of you here today. And I just wanted to give a big... Um, Thank you to our panelists, our forum speakers for their amazing presentations. Um, and so happy to have everyone on tonight. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you, Marlena. Thank you, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you so much.